Hello everybody, Jose Rodriguez here. It is January 19th, Thursday evening. And today I read a post by a person who attempted to print an image containing some very deep blues and purples and it was not rendered properly according to his report. It did not match his monitor and I'm wondering whether he had his monitor calibrated to begin with, but he assumed it was the printer's inability to be able to reproduce those colors. And I told him, yes, you are correct. Most inkjet photo printers have a very difficult time reproducing deep blues, I mean ultramarine blues, deep purples, and all of those types of uh, colors in that realm. And I suggested that he go into either Lightroom or Photoshop and check to make sure that those colors were indeed in gamut. And Photoshop will give you a very rough uh, display of what's in gamut and what's not in gamut. And basically it will cover up whatever colors are out of gamut with just a gray tonality. And you will be able to quickly see. Now, if you guys want to test the ability of your printers and of course it depends on the printer as well the higher end your printer the larger the gamut it can actually reproduce now we have to go back to your monitor is your monitor an srgb monitor it's a very small gamut a adobe rgb monitor much larger and of course i don't think there even is such a thing as a pro photo uh, monitor but anyway Another thing is that if you work with raw images, raw images as they are saved to your card once you shoot them in your camera are not saved with any particular color space. Until you open them in your raw processor or raw plugin, especially Photoshop, and then you export them out or you, you open them in Photoshop at a given format, whether it's uh, uh, PSD or TIFF or whatever, and you can designate the color space that you're going to export those images to Photoshop to be able to work on them. Lightroom, on the other hand, basically opens up your raw image and sort of creates a facsimile of it. And some people will say it's like Pro Photo, which is probably the highest uh, volume that you can possibly have. Your monitor probably cannot, in fact, I'm sure it cannot display all of the colors contained in Profoto. So, but at least you're working in the largest uh, color space that's available when you open up a raw image in Lightroom. So in a way, when you print out a Lightroom, people will say that you may get uh, more information sent to the printer, although it could be bottleneck and it could be turned into an sRGB as it goes into the printer to be printed. And, but nevertheless, it's always better to work with more and then maybe if you have to compress at the end, you compress at the end. But it could also be the fact that he did not soft proof. And if you watch my very last video on printing using a color managed workflow, you saw me do some very basic soft proofing. Now you can really get technical at this and make it quite an elaborate process, but I kept it as simple as I possibly could. Basically, you're going to view your image through the magical filter, which is the ICC profile for that particular paper printer and ink combination. And it will give you an approximation of what the print will look like. Usually it will actually look a little bit brighter than the slightly duller uh, rendition that you will see in your screen when you're soft proofing. But nevertheless, that should have shown him the changes or the inability of a particular profile, particular paper printer ink to be able to reproduce certain colors. Certain colors are just impossible to reproduce. Things that look like neon will never reproduce as you see them on the screen. So anyway, now one test that you guys can perform and remember not everybody has a 12 color printer like a pro 1000 from canon or one of the newer 
uh, printers from Epson that's going to be out pretty soon, the P5000, which is a, one of the sure color series that's about to be released. I have a file that I got from someone else, basically, and it will allow you to test the ability of your printer to reproduce ridiculous colors, okay? Most of these colors will be out of gamut. If you view this under gamut warning, all of the colors on this end of the uh, ramp will be blocked, will look gray. But rendering intent, when you choose to allow your Photoshop or your Lightroom or whatever it is that you use to manage color, you will have the ability to choose a rendering intent. Forget about the profile for now. I'm assuming that you will choose the correct profile for that particular paper, printer, and ink. In this case, this is Canon Pro Luster paper. I printed it with the Canon Pro 1 using Canon inks, okay? So everything is at its optimum uh, condition. So I want you to see the difference, and I certainly hope that video can convey the differences that I will actually easily visually see. Now, let me give you a very, very simple explanation about the two rendering intents. Relative colorimetric. Say, for instance, you have, this is your gamut, and you have a bunch of colors around it. And most of the colors are inside this imaginary circle. Then regardless of what rendering intent you use, the print should come out pretty much identical because nothing needs to be brought in. Now, let's assume now that there are colors existing outside that perimeter. They have to be brought in somehow. So what happens with relative colorimetric is that the colors that are out of gamut are squeezed in, but anything that's in gamut is not shifted. And this is wonderful for shots that contain skin tones. You don't want to change the color of people's skin tones or the, the, the look by shifting those colors in order to make room for the out of gamut color. So relative colorimetric will bring in those out of gamut colors and just squeeze them in, but nothing else will be shifted internally. Perceptual will shift everything at once. Now, they each have their own um, need or reason for using. Like I said, if you want to keep colors are adding gamut as accurate as possible without shifting, then relative colorimetric is the one you will choose. If you're shooting a landscape which has a myriad of colors, especially these fall uh, color trees, they're incredibly uh, saturated and probably out of gamut, you might want to use perceptual because it really doesn't matter if you shift some colors. You know, you know people want to see that type of photograph as bright and colorful as possible. And it really is not that important that some of the colors that are already in gamut will be shifted slightly toward the center to be able to allow the out of gamut colors to be pushed in. Think of it as a circular room with people inside and you're trying to pack more people. Perceptual, perceptual, everybody has to move into the, toward the center. You've heard that before. Everybody move to, to the center of the room. And that way people that are on the outside can get in. Relative doesn't do that. Relative will, will allow people to get in, but those who are already inside do not have to move anymore. So you're going to pack them as well as you can in the outer inner perimeter of that circle. Okay, And that is basically it. So now let's go ahead and look at actual results. All right, That's what the important thing is. Now, this file, and I will provide this file for anyone who wants it, it's basically this, red, green, blue, black, cyan, magenta, and yellow, from the most saturated to all the way to white, okay? And you're looking to be able to render this as gradually as possible without any kind of abrupt, like, saturation changes. Here we have an interesting sort of like a um, spectral representation of light in many different renditions here. And you're going to look for smooth passage. In other words, smooth graduation from one color to the next and so on. So relative colorimetric. And I hope I'm not reflecting too much against the camera here. But you can see how smooth everything tends to be here. Now, 
If I'm going to try to render those purples and blues, I'm going to try to use relative colorimetric. Look at the difference here between just a shade of blue. This is perceptual, this is relative. See the difference here? There are some differences here as well, and here, and here. And you have to be here to look at this a little closer, but there are indeed huge differences. The smoothness is gone in perceptual. Look at that, dark, 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 light. It begins here. Whereas here is dark and it gradually gets lighter and lighter. Same thing with the black. Same thing with some of the other colors. Now, where it really gets good is right here. Look at this one here, how gradual that is. And look at how much it actually jumps. It actually becomes darker here. This color becomes much darker than it should be. It should only be about this shade and it becomes very, very dark. It should not be getting darker. It should stay about the same value, only the hue changing, okay? Perceptual has done something here that's not quite correct. Same thing here. This is almost becoming black. It should be a deep, deep blue, bluish purple, okay? So here the transition between this shade toward the yellow is very smooth. Over here is a little more so-called bumpy, all right? Now, another very important thing is my steps. Do I see any blockage? Well, neutral colors really don't have too much effect when it comes to rendering intent, okay? So for black and white, you don't have to worry about rendering intents. I always stick to perceptual if it's just going to be a landscape photograph. And for most, probably 80% of my images, I choose relative colorimetric only because it tends, as you can see here, with these extreme, extreme colors, it tends to render them a little bit more accurately and smoother. This might actually um, be displayed, this abruptness here, as banding on a sky, for instance, a very deep blue sky from a, from a lighter bottom to a very dark upper sky. So in that case, if that occurs, go ahead and reprint it using relative colorimetric and you should be able to see the difference. Now, if you have a Canon Pro 1, a Canon Pro 100, a Canon Pro 10, a 9500 Mark II, any of those models, Canon, Pro 1000, the newer one, download that XPS driver, okay, and install it only after you have installed a regular driver. When you choose the XPS driver, you should be able to export out to it in 16-bit. Now, what does that do? Maybe not much. Most images, you will not be able to see any drastic differences. But for anything that has a very gradual changing tonality, like a sky, where you have a lighter bottom or horizon sky tapering off to a darker sky, you might get banding on that 8-bit image that you will probably be printing from. And you should actually save that to a 16-bit, say, uh, Adobe RGB image and then send that out to uh, your printer driver, which will be the XPS. That's the one you would choose from. So it will show up as two Canon Pro 1s, for, for instance. And you will just choose the XPS. If the images don't require it, there's really no need to print to the XPS. Now, when you print from Lightroom or from QImage, which actually do not change the format, you're kind of working in a pseudo uh, pro photo RGB type working space, go ahead and use XPS. If it helps, it helps. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It doesn't cost you anything other than choosing a different driver. So you might as well take at any ad advantage of anything that may be improving your final rendition onto paper. All right, so that is my bit of uh, suggestion. If you guys are encountering weird, see how abrupt the change is here and how smooth the change is here in this graduated um, shades of different colors here. And it depends on the color. It depends on the color because each ink set, each driver, each print engine renders or dithers or mixes 
the inks differently. Now, a good custom profile comes into play as well. This is using the Canon can profile. And if you guys really want to read something interesting, go to the digital dog. Okay. This guy is a hundredfold more um, informed and a lot smarter than I am in more technical prowess than I will ever have. And he has a video that I believe is called not all profiles are made the same or something to that effect. And he will take you actually inside the profile and show you physically in 3D, in 3D form, what a profile looks like, the gamut of a profile looks like, and how it's able to reproduce certain colors better than some other profile for the same paper, okay? And he will tell you that not all canned OEM profiles that come with a driver are best. And the reason being is that out of a thousand Pro Ones, for instance, they all have slight differences. And so the profile has to take into, into effect all of those little differences. And basically it gives you a slightly less um, good profile than one that you would make yourself for that specific model Pro 1000 printer that you have, or Pro 1, that specific inkset or batch, that specific batch of paper. Yes, it gets, it gets to be that nitpicky, okay? And so you will always get better results if you carefully make a profile for your particular printer, the one you have in your room, and not the, you know, one that works with 10,000 Pro ones, okay? That has to be just kind of like good enough, whereas yours is going to be the best. And so you will extract the most out of that particular printer and the most out of that uh, ability to render some of these ridiculous colors that are almost impossible to render properly right here. All of these. This is what most people complain about, this particular range of colors. All right. Okay, so in the next video, I'm going to talk about a little bit of a problem that people just don't seem to understand about Epson printers that have that black ink change when you first initiate them. And it's quite interesting. And uh, of course, it took someone who actually did a lot of testing to figure it out to see what actually is happening internally. So we will be back. I'm about 20 subscribers from 5,000. So pretty soon, pretty soon. All right. Thank you so much again. Don't forget to subscribe, share, and like as always. Until the next time, everyone, happy printing. Bye-bye.